Welcome to the Speaking Podcast. You'll find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com. We're also on BitChute and YouTube as Speaking Podcast. I also have the Awakening Podcast, the Learn Polish Podcast, and the Meditation Podcast, and all can be found on RoyCollin.com. Today, my guest, all the way from the USA, is it Portland, Oregon? You got please, it. Please welcome Iggy Perl. Perillo. Perillo. You got Perillo. it. Perillo. So welcome to the show. Thanks. It's so great to be here. So I always like people to let them introduce themselves more than, rather than me scripting something. So. Fantastic. Well, my name is Iggy Perillo, and I am a leadership educator. My business is WSL Leadership, and I help people lead better and teams work together better through masterclasses and masterminds, as well as some one-on-one -on -one leadership programs. Okay, very good, very good. And I've, I've looked through a lot of the stuff. There's a lot of things that I want to get into, but I always like to know uh, the speaker's journey, you know, from when they were younger, mm -hmm. how they, you know, either overcame it or was just jumping about from an early age. <laughs> I think I was a little more jumping about, literally. I started uh, formatively in my younger years, did a lot of sports through, um, just through school and different things like that, which I think gave me the impression that teams could do more together than, and teams that didn't work well together, things were terrible and that leadership mattered a ton on terms of how those teams function. So that the individuals in leadership roles were really important and the team followership was also important. And then after that, I spent, and still do spend a fair amount of time in the wilderness area leading expeditions, either in the summer canoeing and backpacking and in the winter dog sled and ski expeditions for many years, helping strangers come together and really like become leaders and teams in ways that are extremely practical when they need to get from place to place. And so my practice, then I'll inform my practice to be very skill oriented and also very like focused on the now and the present versus kind of, you know, imagining other things happening is great, but sometimes you actually just need to carry the stuff down the trail. Okay. Excellent. So you mentioned uh, masterminds, and I know I've been kind of in a few mastermind groups. Are you more of a facilitator, or what way does that work? Yeah, I have been cultivating masterminds within specialized communities because I find that that helps people really get to the heart of matter quickly. And so, for example, I'm working on cultivating a master right now of veterinarians because veterinarians have a really unique practice in terms of being leaders, but also practitioners within a lot, a lot of their um medical practices that they're running. So that's like one group where they suddenly all speak the same language when you bring them together. And so I can facilitate those conversations and find the right people to bring together. I've also facilitated masterminds for folks in roller derby leadership, which is again, another really specialized community where you're working with volunteers, but also athletics, but also um, producing events on a huge scale at times. And so those leaders are called to be super multifaceted and so just bringing the people into the room together doesn't really work. They sort of need that structure and facilitation so that each individual can get the most out of those experiences. So I find the people, bring them together, and then facilitate those masterminds so people can learn and grow in ways that matter to them really specifically. And is it something that kind of is long-term, you know, kind of a year plus or, yeah? Uh, mine are shorter-ish, usually three or six months is what like kind of the amount of time that I set up for masterminds. And so folks, I mean, you can join more and more obviously after that, but I find that that amount of time really gives people like a boost in the right direction. And then often they're like, okay, I got it. Now I'm ready to go do whatever. And then like I stay in touch. So I hear from people down the road when they're like, oh wait, this other thing or this other thing. But I think once you sort of get people focused on how to lead and connect them with each other, I know some of my mastermind mates have like maintained connections over time which is really cool to see and i know that's another thing that you kind of concentrate on is on personality types and i suppose that can happen in a mastermind as well where you might get say you know a bad egg a bad egg <laughs> in a cake so how do you actually overcome that not just in masterminds mm -hmm. but in in general as well for business and cooperation sure well i think in masterminds i do a lot of work on the front end to make sure people know what they're getting into and make sure people are a good fit. And not everyone is like, I think some people, I mean, and part of it's mastermind education, not everyone really knows what a mastermind is. And it really recalls a lot for the participants. They really need to be able to engage with other people and offer and give a lot. And some people go to a mastermind thinking it's more like a class, like that they go to receive, and that doesn't really work out in the end. And so I think that's where, um, 
education on the front end just really helps people understand and understand the commitment it takes. Like you need to show up, you need to be there for yourself and for your other mastermind mates. And people feel that really quickly on, they're like, oh, I'm accountable to these people. Like they, they're going to ask what I've done since last, you know, meeting since last time. So they like that, I think works out pretty well. So I try to avoid getting people that are, that aren't on board with that process, you know, and that's screening on the front end. And I think in businesses though, it's harder because you can't always choose to who your coworker is or who your boss is, you know, you're just in a business and you have someone that's uh, a challenging personality or difficult to work with in different ways. And that becomes, uh, becomes problematic for folks who suddenly are struggling and really stressed by a coworker or a boss. And so I think in those times that I, um, revert sort of more to skills training and master classes. So just giving people skills, like how are you gonna deal with that difficult personality, but also what are your strengths that you're bringing to the situation? I think people try to lead or engage with other people through sort of formulas and ways that aren't authentic to them. And then it gets weird and they're like, oh, well, I'm supposed to be really, you know, hardcore about this thing and really strict and that doesn't help. And it gets more awkward because they think they have to act a certain way when in reality, there's miscommunication or communication breakdown. I'm sure you appreciated can appreciate that where it just people aren't on the same page or they're not saying the same thing. And so that's really the cause of the problem versus, oh, their personality, they're just mean or, you know, whatever. I'm like, there's probably some breakdown along the way that needs to be addressed, which is really a communication problem and not a personality problem. So I try to help people sort those out and understand expectations and communication as well as skills for just how to deal in the moment with when someone is like saying or doing something and you're like, that's actually, we need to we need to move in a different direction. We're not quite headed the same way on the same page. And you know, you mentioned uh, you know some people come into the mastermind kind of you know basically trying to get stuff out. Of it. it's, it's, I think it's kind of similar to BNI because I was in BNI and there's people the, normally the people that were complaining were the ones that would never help anyone else. I would always go in there and it was like, how can I help each person? And it just people you know you get so much business back just by not even thinking about getting business, just going in to help people. And I think in a mastermind is kind of similar. Yeah. You have to have this uh, sort of generosity mindset going into it. It's a different type of space. And I think, I think that's different for some people who have been in business or organizations that are like, Oh no, I got to take, take, take and take money, take this, take, you know, it's just sort of a different mindset around how to work and engage with other people. And it's so beneficial. Just like you were saying, like suddenly once you start switching to giving and, reaching out to people versus, you know, kind of trying to grab people and pull them in it, uh, just the whole vibe and energy changes. And I think you're right. It just frees up a lot of, yeah, a lot of wisdom and knowledge, you know, that goes out there, but also those connections are really form in really strong and meaningful ways for business, for growth, for learning, you know, whatever your like purpose is and to engage with them. Exactly. And like when you're doing these, I mean, because I mean, it's mainly about kind of speaking. So you're speaking in front of, I don't know how many people are in the typical mastermind group, but like one, how do you actually organize your day? And two, to make sure that you're actually, you know, getting your point across, because, you know, it's not everybody, unfortunately, will be paying attention and someone will be glued <laughs> to their phones. Yeah, right. And, and it's weird, I think a little bit virtually, just because you don't, you can't quite see everyone's body language in the same way. But I think mastermind groups I have are six people, I think is the most. So four to six is usually the number. And, and that many on one screen at a time, you can sort of see who's like leaning forward to speak. And so it just kind of takes tweaking some skills around, you know, how to have a conversation. And I would say being comfortable with sort of silences and spaces while people are you know, there's a little lag, there's a little, you know, like just the weirdness of um, online group communication. But I think in groups that small, everyone can be unmuted simultaneously. So then people can chime in and people can do whatever. I find like bigger groups, like it just gets too many people talk over each other or they, you know, it just kind of gets messy. And so for me, structuring my day, I think just involves taking some time to be more quiet and more focused and more centered beforehand because in, as i'm a facilitator it's not my job to be the educator or be the person that's like offering again it's not my job to like bleh and like tell them everything it's my job to build connection so understanding how my role flows and that doesn't mean i'm silent i'm just like good luck with that like it take i think there is there are skills to facilitation and how to draw people in and how to let people know i think some folks enjoy smaller groups because like a big group, you know, speaking in a big group is really intimidating to people or they don't, they feel sort of exposed or a little put out there. And so by having smaller groups, but also structure, so people know when 
they know what's expected of them. They know when when their turn is going to be to speak. They know how the group is going to interact. So all that stuff, the structure part is part of it. And the other part is helping people get to know each other and being intentional about how are we building connection with this group? How are we, what are we here to share? And what are we here to do? Like, how are we forming a, arrangements and agreements so that everyone in the group feels comfortable speaking and feels comfortable speaking about challenges or things that are hard for them, which can feel vulnerable or can feel exposing at times. If someone's talking about, oh, this thing is going, is really hard or this thing went wrong. Like, what should I have done differently? You know, I think those are where masterminds become really powerful and people need that sense of psychological safety where, oh, I'm, I can say this and it's okay in this group. I can say I failed or I can say I'm struggling and people are connected. So there is um, in the beginning, for sure, a degree of just team development that needs to happen, even within that small little crew. So people know each other and are comfortable. And then just asking people to be vulnerable and asking people to be able to be courageous and share challenges. And I feel like there's this sort of curve of like, people are like, oh, I don't know, I'm nervous, I'm nervous. Then suddenly they're like, oh, I get it. And then it just takes off and people can communicate, they can build those connections. They can, and it's super personal, but also mutually supportive at the same time. Exactly. And like uh, you were doing this prior to the lockdown in, uh, was it always online or were you actually meeting the people? And uh, I was doing more team development before the lockdown because I was in person. And so I could go facilitate things with teams and it was, uh, my process is very experiential. So I drive engagement a lot. And so I don't do a lot of, um, hey, I'm just going to go give you a lecture. It's like, hey, we're going to do some stuff together. We're going to interact. We're going to have questions. Like I ask a lot of my participants, like they're in, they're always being asked questions, being doing things, interacting. And so masterminds were sort of the next iteration when I had to go online. I'm like, great, how can I interact with people? How can I keep continuous engagement, continue the sense of connection and fostering growth and development through the virtual world? And that has actually been you know, expanding, uh, you know, it's not just locally here in Oregon anymore. I can suddenly work with people. I've had people in Europe, in Australia, in the U S on both coasts, like in a group together. So it's just been kind of an amazing, like opening of who I can connect with at any good one time in a mastermind. Yeah. Cause I think uh, a lot of people, they look at all the negativity about what's going on, but you know, there is positivity. You can actually, you know, and not everybody wants to be one traveling, you know, cause if you are no. traveling a lot, you yeah. know, cause it sucks the energy out of you. You might think at the start, Oh, I get to see different places. But once you're traveling a lot, it's like, you don't want to be living out of a suitcase. So when you can be, you know, working, cause I, I find with me that like, if I am going anywhere, you lose your routine. And mm, that's the mm -hmm, worst mm -hmm. part, you know, whether it's the food that you're eating or if you're doing some exercise or something. And whereas now, if you're, you know, doing it online, you can kind of ha still have your your routine. And it's brilliant that you've, you know, got international clients. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's been really amazing. And, and I think you're right, like traveling, there is like a, an allure, like I enjoy traveling and going new places. But if I'm just going to be there for 48 hours and then fly home, like you don't really get to like sink in and be in a place and you know people are lovely and i really enjoy working with people in person but it's yeah it's kind of making the best of what we got i guess is where i'm at with this right now and like when you were um meeting people doing uh, like say the events or a workshop how do you organize yourself because i'm always curious because everybody's got their own little kind of tips and tricks i'm just curious what way you structure your hour you know whether it's a few days or just a couple of mm -hmm. hours mm -hmm. i think most of what i did was either like like if it was really local here in town, it'd be an hour or 90 minutes at a time, but like over time, right? So I'd have, you know, immediate, like once a month or every other few weeks or something like that. And I am in really intentional about developing a curriculum for the clients I'm working with. So they'll often come to me and say, oh, I really, like our team is struggling with, you know, this or that, you know, they'll, they have a reason <laughs> usually that I'm in touch with them. And so I spend time, to me, it's really about, like I always want to have them make sure that they feel connected to each other. And you'd be surprised. Like you can find any team, like any organization, if you bring, you know, the teammates together, 10, 20, 30 people, and you ask them, you know, what's the main purpose of this team? Or how does this team function? What are the strengths of this team? 20 or 30 people will tell you all different answers for any of those questions. Like they're not really on the same page. They don't really know each other. And they might be in the same department or the same organization, you know, if it's a smaller organization, but they don't, like, you know, they don't necessarily interact. They don't know a lot about how each other function and how each other think. So helping people get to know each other is always a part of my process. And that's like who they are as people, but also how they operate. Like, oh, you know, they can, like the big personalities are pretty obvious sometimes. Like, oh, they're going to be really loud. They're going to be really out there. And people are like, okay, great. But I think there's a lot more 
subtle personalities that get overshadowed at times within bigger groups. You know, they, people just sort of default to let the, the loud people be loud, but all these sort of slightly quieter people are getting the work done. They're there, they're contributing, but maybe not so vocal. So I try to make their space for each person's voice to be heard, for each person to have who what's authentic to them out there and part of the team. So that's again, building the sense of psychological safety because some teams are really just don't function well. And if ideas come up that are not, you know, in line with the status quo, they get shot down or the person gets ridiculed, you know, like there's not, there are plenty of unhealthy and toxic teams out there. So my job is to create spaces where those people can, everyone can have a voice and everyone's voice can be heard and listened to and valued equally, even when there are, you know, different sort of power structures and power dynamics in place. And so that's, I think, part of my process. And then from there, developing what this team needs, because every team is a little different in terms of how they function, who they are, what they need, what their challenges are that they're facing at any given time, like what personalities or what cultures have started to dominate within that team. So yeah, I guess that's like the short part is get to know each other first, then figure out how to give people the tools to solve their problems for themselves. I work more as an educator than a consultant. So I want to give you the tools to do it yourself versus me show up and tell you like, here's what you got to do, ABC, done, peace out. You know, like it, it doesn't suit me as a, just my flow for how I operate. And like what well, I mean, from my experience, what I've noticed with people is the quiet ones tend to have the the better ideas, and the ones that are constantly talking are just talkers, and the, you know they don't have a yeah. It's really they, to actually get them to be quiet and get the quiet ones to speak up is is the the key really. Yeah. Absolutely, a hundred percent. So what what else are you doing? I I know. Um, <clears throat> Like communication breakdowns, uh, you are killing productivity. So I think that's that, that's an important one because it is true, and I have seen it. You know, working for a company, also having business in myself, and I'd like to hear your your thoughts on that one. Oh yeah, I think I would say most of the problems I see can be traced back to some communication breakdown at the end, and then I think there's sort of two types. There's one person saying something and one person hearing something different. Like that's one kind of easy, obvious one. Like, oh, I said Thursday, you thought I said Friday, you know, whatever, like easy, that's the easy one. The more subtle one and the more difficult one is the unspoken expectations. And that's a, just a whole nother category of communication breakdown. Like how people assume people are gonna react or how people assume we should be doing this. Like, oh, we're all on the same page. We all know, as soon as someone tells me we all know something, I'm like, mm, they don't all know. and. If you haven't actively articulated that, that communication is actually lost. I've definitely worked with people in organizations like, well, they should know. I'm like, if you're saying they should know, or we all know, but you're not actually saying what that thing is, you know, like, oh, we all know that whatever our team is focused on, you know, we do it like our teamwork first before we do our individual work, whatever it is, you know, like, you know, teams have sort of different functions and processes. Like, do we all know that? Have you like articulated that, what that means, what that looks like and how people feel. So I feel like that, the unspoken expectations are often at the root of so many things. And that becomes unspoken expectations for what we do and our processes, but also unspoken expectations that we align on our values and how, what is like the foundation beneath what we're doing. And so I think bringing some of those pieces of communication out is really crucial. And so many people are like, well, yeah, but we have this, you know, we have the team mission on the website. It's obvious. And you're like, is it obvious? Like, is that team mission really, has anyone ever looked at that? You know, it's like this dusty old poster in the corner that has like our team values. And you're like, it seems like this is not very relevant or very real. So some of those pieces of communication mean going back to like, well, what, how do we function? How do we want to function as a team? What are our unspoken expectations that we've sort of you know, as the team evolves or changes, like we're like, oh yeah, we're all on the same page. And then, you know, someone new comes on, someone leaves and then like, oh yeah, we're all on the same page. But like those new people coming in weren't there, you know, as these things were being developed or have a different interpretation of it based on how things evolved. So I try to help teams be much more clear in their communication. And that those are the breakdowns that I think really are crush productivity because people are just sort of either feel like they're just kind of out in left field. Like, why are they doing that thing? Why are they wasting the energy there? And you're like, well, was it clear what they were supposed to be doing? Like, yeah, it was super clear. I'm like, were you, you said this, but did, you meant that, you know, like making sure what you say and mean line up and we're on the same page and our values are aligned and our goals align. I think there's lots of ways. I work with athletes some um, often and there's ways that you can be successful, but you don't always win. And so like, what is actually success and what is actually winning? Like winning is like number of points on the board or whatever, but how are we gonna be successful even those times when we don't win? Like, what are we working on? How are we functioning? How are we working together? 
uh, yeah, so I those I think are all pieces of communication breakdown, like defining those things clearly and articulately for the people you're working with. And you know, you mentioned about, like, say, the team vision, you know, the company vision on websites. I mean, I have seen a few companies, and it's basically made just for the public, and that's not oh. how they actually operate. And you know, that's why there's some confusion as well in in house. Oh yeah, for sure. There's, I think, if you just cruise through any website for major companies and go find their mission statement or their you know about page and read it you'd probably you would probably be surprised and be like oh really this is what their thing is this is what you know they think they're doing this and huh like that's not that's not how it looks on the inside or that's how the how people there would say it at all that that's how things work so yeah that's it's interesting. interesting what about dealing with somebody with an ego oh <laughs> yeah i mean I think this is, it's tough because we want people, I think there's good things about like, there's a good amount of ego, then there's like too much, right? You know, and we want people to be, to take initiative. We want people to be like, oh, here's this great idea. I'm going to bring it forward. I'm going to, you know, pursue things that matter. And that's great if these things matter to the whole team and to everyone, if they're like, here, I want to pursue and put energy in the things that matter to me first, before the team, before, you know, our group goals, that's where ego can get problematic. And I think that, I mean, you're going to hear some themes, I guess, today. Like one of them is like a values alignment, right? Like are our values actually in a line? Like it's, ego is fine if it's in service of the team and the organization. Ego is not great when it puts the individual against the team or the individual above, you know, separate from the team. And so having, those are some hard and messy conversations to talk about what does this actually look like in terms of like how we want people's energy to be present on our team. And it's great to have a big personality and a big ego. You know, there I'm sure we've both worked with people who are just, you know, they're show people, like they're out there. And you're like, oh, this is like the face of the company. Great. And if that, you know, that's not problematic fundamentally. It's problematic if they're only in service of their image and their own selves, It, you know, as opposed to the company. And so how we can we rein in that? And I think the there's a sort of flaw within leadership as people move up on the leadership sort of ladder and food chain, sometimes they get less and less feedback. And so their ego gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And they're like, oh, well, but I am the company. I'm like, oh. I don't think you are. And I think that thinking becomes problematic and it might not be as, you know, explicitly said that I am the company. And so, you know, you know, this kind of weird um, sort of godlike personality type, but I think there is a space to give people really meaningful feedback and to have that, that's just another skill, how to give feedback that people can hear and listen to and take in and process because the big ego also is delicate to being, you know, popped like a balloon. So they get defensive, they get angry, you know, well, I am the company, how, you know, you're destroying everything by telling me that, you know, and you're like, okay, dial it back. And like, how can we connect with this person and have, communicate in a way that you hear and understand that what you're doing actually isn't serving everyone, or it is maybe only serving you and you are actually not everyone else and dividing those out. And those are tough conversations for sure, but valuable and super effective. When done well, you can really steer people into the right direction and get that energy flowing with the team and raising the whole team up versus the individual versus the team. I've, um, I've come across in my career, a lot of people, <clears throat> I would say they have ego as well, but they think they're creative, but they're really disruptive because they're just constantly, their brain is on overdrive mm. and they're like, we're going to build this, we're going to do this, we're going to, and it just causes, especially if there's a team on them, they get, you know, they go insane from dealing with a person like that. Oh yeah, they just whiplash back and forth, like, oh, here's our, here's our project for today, like, well, no, wait, here's our other project, or they... You know, I think there's this person that sees themselves like as the idea person, like, I have all these ideas, just go execute. And then everyone else is like, hold on, like, which ideas? Like, how does this help? You know, yeah, it, it can be a total mess when you have the ideas person that is, if that's their only job is to like, just tell people ideas and what to do, that's sort of, yeah, not always in service of the team again. And I think the sometimes helping people will be like, cool, now we need to follow through. Now we need time to like mature this. Now we need time to an investment, you know, whatever that means, energy resources to make this vision a reality. I think, yeah, I mean, it's fun to be like, I'm going to tell you things and you're going to do them. But in reality, that's not really emotionally intelligent leadership to just kind of order people around. And so I think, again, there's skills to understanding how to work and how to communicate with people in an emotionally intelligent way. So you're serving and building connection and relationship versus you know, if so, if a leader tells me like, well, I'm just here to build widgets and not relationships, like I'm like, 
we should fire you immediately. Like that's not going to help your team to just, you know, build this outcome without the relationships with your team and your folks along with you. And my experience with, because I've come across a lot of people like that. My experience is they never actually do anything. They're just talkers, <laughs> you know, they, they, they're constantly, but when, when you're, they're supposed to do something, they're always the ones that let you down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Like no follow through. That's yeah. I think it's just interesting how people sort of pigeon self pigeonhole themselves into roles. Like, well, I'm the ideas person, not the execution person. And you're like, cool. You actually still need to be the execution support team, you know, or I think I've had people uh, who are like, well, I'm the, I, I work on the spreadsheets. I don't work out with these like messy relationships. I'm like, cool. And you might need to communicate and interact with people in a way that's like human versus, you know, the technology side or the spreadsheet side a little bit. But I think it's, yeah, we're multifaceted and we, we do ourselves a disservice to pigeonhole ourselves too narrowly in terms of, yeah, I only do ideas or I only do relationships or I only do spreadsheets or I only do whatever. Like you actually can do other things and it looks different. I think we have sometimes a model of like, well, I'm the idea person. I'm not the execution person because, you know, X, Y, Z, because an execution person acts like this. I'm like, well, that's not how you authentically would be executing. That's how someone else does that. Like how, what does that mean for you to be in, engaged in the execution or the follow through side of things? And it's fine. Like it doesn't, we don't all need to be the same, like obviously, but I think we sometimes hold ourselves to such a high standard for what it would look like that we're like, oh, I shouldn't even try. I talk to people in leadership all the time. We're like, well, I'm not a leader because I'm not that loud mouth person that's just out there in front of the crowd. I'm like, you still are a leader. You're just that more quiet, subtle leader that is thinking and knows what's going on and sees what's happening and communicate to the people. That's an equally valid, equally authentic leadership style. But because they're assuming they're not a drill sergeant that they can't be a leader. I'm like, well, no, you just need to do it in a way that's authentic and true to you. So helping people find that in terms of like, yeah, don't pigeonhole yourself as a, a merely a blabbermouth or only the ideas or only the this or only the that. Like you can, like you are multifaceted and you are able to be flexible and do it in a way that's authentic to you. You don't need to do this how, you know, none of us need to give speeches like the greatest orators we've ever heard. Like that's not gonna happen. That's why they're so great and we're just us, but we can, talk we can communicate we can build connection with people i think uh, it all comes down to communication so whether it's the troublesome guy the guy with the ego how we connect with them we have to try to talk to their language make them accountable because a lot of the times people will promise you yeah and just set boundaries so you agree on actually the terms and i think that's a, that's just, just the way to deal with all these uh, different personalities yeah, I think there's this really interesting part. And then I know the, uh, like when you put things in writing, right? That becomes suddenly everything changes. You're like, oh, we're talking, we're talking. Like, oh yeah, you're totally gonna follow through on that, no problem. But then I'm like, hey, will you write down like what day you're gonna follow through on that? Like what day I'm gonna check in with you? Then suddenly they're like, oh my God, uh, uh, you know, like there's like, you, you know, it could be panic or whatever. Or it's just super real once we've written down, like, okay, you said you're gonna do this by Wednesday awesome. I'll check with you Wednesday and see how that's coming along. You know, whatever it is first, you know, just having that writing or that clear or like actual deadlines suddenly, um, it, it has a weird effect on people. Like it makes it very tangible and very specific. And now I can't weasel out of it because like, well, you know, this thing and um, the idea, you know, whatever, like kind of fall back on excuses and blame when people are accountable. Yeah. I love, there's definitely a space for putting things like literally putting things in writing that really basic, you know, like, Oh, here's a deadline for this, whatever it is. We both agree. Perfect. Fantastic. But yeah, suddenly action happens Amazing. or you learn a lot more about that personality one or the other. Yeah. No, that's the way I, I like to do any of the businesses that I've been involved in do minutes and have who's accountable for that action item and a date because then the following week or whether it's a couple of days later or whatever you go, Hey John, you said uh, you'd have that done by Friday, you know, and it's kind of, it's there rather than just a conversation it makes it you tend to get way more productive when you kind of you know keep it in writing absolutely and the uh the mastermind groups i facilitate like there's usually a section at the end where everyone has to state their homework they're going to do before the next meeting and suddenly people are like well i'm gonna blah 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 do this have this conversation you know make this form do whatever and then um like, I, you know, I keep track of all it. So it's all written down. So I can send, like, if the group is meeting, like, maybe other, every other week, and then in between we can be like, hey, just a reminder, here's what you said you were going to do. Here's what you said. Here's what you said. And then the next meeting comes around. And, like, that's always, for me, the first step of the meeting is to be like, cool, how do people do on their homework? Whatever it is. And they're choosing their assignment. They know what they need to work on. They've gotten input. 
uh, and it's fascinating. Suddenly that just that little piece of accountability and they're like, oh, I've gotten so much done. I'm like, oh, wait, I, I suddenly need to do this because I know my meeting's happening. I know people are going to ask, did you do that thing you said you were going to do? And like that accountability is an amazing tool, especially when you have a supportive accountability versus like, you didn't do it. I'm going to, you know, punish you and put the smack down. Like it's actually not motivational to punish people for not doing what they said they were going to do. But I think it's hugely motivational to have a group at where like, oh, you tried it, but it didn't work out. Like, tell me more. Like, let's learn why. Like you said you were going to do this thing and you it sort of fizzed out for some reason. Like, let's look into that. Like, what do you still need to do? Did you try the right thing? You know, I think that type of learning environment, people just go through the roof. Like, it's just amazing, like the progress that can be made. I've done something um, last year, mid last year, and they had a very high level accountability document. And there was about 100 people involved. And what what I noticed is that maybe 10 people, 15 people, we were doing the stuff straight away. Then you'd kind of people, you know, they were waiting till the last minute. And then you would get <laughs> people with excusitis. They always had an excuse why they couldn't do it. And you can see your air A players from that. You go, mm-hmm. they don't, mm-hmm. they tend to be, you don't get the guy that's doing nothing, then starts jumping up doing everything because of accountability. <laughs> they tend to be, they're like that in life and everything. That's my experience from what, what I'm, I'm seeing with these things. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think those are just habits, though. I think people can learn to be that A player, like if they really want to. And like, you know, it's just changing habits is hard, right? If my habit is to wait to the last minute every single time, then I suddenly want to do it not wait to the last minute. Like that's, there's huge effort in changing any kind of habit, you know, that we have. And that's just another one. And people have structures and people have style and people have tools to do that. And it takes effort also and setting yourself up for success and doing things like that. And I think there's, space to learn and grow in those ways. And I think you're right. I think people like if you practice, if you don't practice anything like working with athletes again, if you never practice and then you're just like, well, I'm just going to shine on game day. I'm just going to save all my energy. Like, okay, you're actually not going to grow or get any better. You know, like I think that people sort of want to rest on their laurels a little bit or rest on kind of coast along. And, th- and that happens the same thing in business. Like I'm just going to kind of, you know, save it for the big day, save it for the big presentation, save my energy for, you know, something or other. I'm like, cool, but you're not growing your muscles. You know, if you're an athlete, you're not growing your skills. If you're in business, you're not growing your business if you're in business. And so like, you're not setting yourself up for success. Like you're not practicing excellence. Like the only way to be excellent is to practice excellence and practice excellently. And so if you just practice garbage the whole time, your outcome will in fact continue to be garbage. Like, and then people are surprised. Like, well, I was saving all my energy. I'm like, that's not, that's that's not helping you. And it's not really how it works to save all your energy for, you know, this one moment, this one thing. Okay, and that's kind of like some people, they think they will apply themselves more if they get the raise instead of the Mm -hmm. mentality of do as much as you can and then it will be seen and then you'll get a raise. But some people are on the beliefs, no, I only get paid to do so much and that's what I'll do. But once they pay me more, then I'll do more. And it's like, no, that never works out. Well, I see the same with leadership. I think within an organization, people are like, well, I'm not the leader, so I can't speak up or I'm not the leader, so I can't offer an idea. Or things are a little bit eh, like the culture here's a little, eh, but I, it's not my place to speak up or say anything. I'm like, well, if you never practice your leadership skills, like why would anyone put you in a leadership role? And in some places that's not a useful question because people get put in leadership roles based on their number of years, you know, like, oh, you've been here three years. Now you're a team leader. You've been here five years. Now you're a section leader. You know, like sometimes it's just age or, oh, you're really good at you know, your job you're doing, cool, now we'll put you in people doing that job. And leadership skills are totally different than often the job skills, especially in a technical job. If you, I talked to someone recently who was like, yeah, I work with, as a programmer, he's like, I work with all these programmers and suddenly you get promoted to being in charge of programmers, which is very different than the literal skills of programming. Like leading programmers is different than programming. But I think like anything, you can learn those skills and you can practice those skills and you can build up the habits of being a good leader wherever you are in the organization, being a good, clear communicator, being someone that is reliable, being someone that does their work, you know, and is giving and gener- approaches with generosity. I think those aspects of leadership anyone can do anywhere in the organization, even if they're the intern who just, you know, is there, you know, two days a week for an hour. You know, I think people can engage and practice their leadership skills anywhere and in any style that will help them develop as leaders, but also help their organization and whoever they're connected with all rise together. I remember uh, I used to work for a mechanical contractor and they had a habit of the best um, plumber or fitter 
would eventually they'd make them the actual charge hand or the foreman. And that's like taking your best person, to, you know, to a totally different role. And, and, and I know it can happen in like software development and, you know, programming and everything. And like people must really kind of look at that. Why take your best person Think assuming because that's the assumption they think that they'll that person will then make 10 people like him and that's not how it works <laughs> they're totally different skills like it, like yeah i was, t- I was talking to someone recently about how in sports we don't all assume that all great players make a great coach and i mentioned this to a fella and he was like oh my gosh wayne gretzky was the worst coach ever in hockey and he just like went crazy i'm like okay I'm glad you have that example on hand, but we sort of know in sports, like just because someone can shoot a lot of baskets doesn't mean that they're a great basketball coach, but yet in business, we assume, oh, just because you're really good at, you know, doing your job, suddenly you can lead people doing your job. I mean, that keeps me in business, helping people develop leadership skills, but in reality, that's not helping your business grow thoughtfully, you know, and I think there's space for leadership development as people go. And I think some organizations more than others have sort of built in leadership development and they have like internal pipelines and stuff like that in place, but not everywhere. And I don't think it's as attentive everywhere or as intentional. Like why should this person be a good leader when they've just been good at, yeah, mechanical engineering? Like what, what about them makes them a good leader? Exactly. Great question. Maybe something, maybe they've had experience, maybe not. So listen, Nagy, thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, it all comes down to proper communication. So how can, how can people get in contact with you? Uh, I can be found via my website, which is wslleadership.com. And I love talking with people just communicating. So you can email me, Iggy at wslleadership.com. And I would love to connect. I'm on the social media. I'm out there, you know, whatever. You can find me various places. Uh, but that's the easiest way to learn about what I'm doing and what I've got going on or just to connect and continue conversations. Brilliant. And I'll include all the links on the podcast description so people will be able to find you easy. So thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me today, Roy. It's been great talking with you. So that's all for the Speaking Podcast. You'll find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com or on BitChute and YouTube at Speaking Podcast. Until next week, take care.